thank you everyone for joining the Hope Matrix today and Happy New Year. Uh, it's our first time back in the new year, so I hope you all had a nice end of 2020 and into 2021. We're super excited about our episode today. We just launched an initiative called Hopeful Cities. Really, really excited about what we're doing here in Reno, Nevada. And we are aiming to teach hope to the entire city of Reno. You know, I've talked about hope previously and we've really gone in and identified the five keys to hope. And those are recognizing and reducing the stress response is really the first key to getting, getting to hope. Uh, the second key is practicing habits for happiness. The third is taking inspired actions using SMART goals. The fourth is creating a hope network. And the fifth is overcoming hope challenges. And really key to all of that is being able and willing to reach out when you need support with any of those things. So again, really excited about our guest today. We have here Tharun Galagali. He is with Talkspace and he was part of our, and is part of our Hopeful Cities initiative. So really excited to welcome here today and talk more about Hopeful Cities and also about Talkspace and what they are doing to support people getting to hope. So welcome today. Thank you, Catherine. It's an honor to be on the show. Yeah, it's great to be here. And we did so much work in December together. We've come quite a long way. So really yeah. excited to have you here. Take a yeah. breath in the new year and talk to you. I am. Yeah, it's, uh, it feels like just yesterday we met and then here we are um, doing something powerful for a city together. So um, honored to be here again and uh, really excited about all the work you've done. Um, and when I heard about the Hopeful Cities Initiative and the hopeful kind of network that you're building out. Um, I was honored to be a part of it. And Thank I am. you. Thank you so much. And it's great. All of the work that you all are doing at Talkspace and really, you know, we have such a major mental health challenge globally. Yeah. And so finding innovative ways to use technology and bring people together with therapists is so important. So why don't you just tell me a little bit first about your role at Talkspace and what yeah. you're doing there? Yeah, so I'm currently the Director of Strategy and Operations at Talkspace, um, focusing specifically on the unit that works with organizations, so the B2B team, that organizations can include uh, companies, governments, health insurance plans. But yeah, as you may or may not know, or as listeners may or may not know, Talkspace has been around for the last eight years. Um, we were founded as a company that targeted mainly consumers. So we worked directly with consumers and we still do. That's the primary sort of focus of the business. But um, in the last few years, we have uh, branched out into other units, including working with health plans to help you if you're covered under Aetna, Cigna, Optum, Primera, to name a few. You'll have access to Talkspace. You pay a copay, of course. Um, but you get access. And then we're also working with companies, uh, some of the biggest brands in the world, um, but also some small businesses that are looking to provide care for their people. And here we actually just, uh, the company pays for the care for their people and the people don't pay anything. They get access to therapy uh, at scale. Most recently, we were was really honored to open up some of our first public partnerships, so specifically with uh, City of Reno, working alongside you, as you know, Catherine, where we were able to provide care for 200,000 plus, 200,000 folks in the city free of cost to them. They get access to unlimited messaging therapy with the provider of their choice. So um, yeah, I, I kind of work on the strategy and ops unit, which sort of does a number of different things at the company. But uh, for me, that includes working on the government initiative, which has been really personally fulfilling given my background. Yeah, that's amazing. And it's pretty groundbreaking, really, to provide therapy to an entire city at no cost. I mean, when you think about access to care and how hard it is for people to get to care, yeah. um, afford care, the inequality of pay of providers, and so really providing that opportunity to a city yeah, it's groundbreaking. I, yeah. I think I, I often envisioned a time when it would be as easy to go to a police station or to therapy as it would to a police station, you know, and to jail. Yeah, it should so be. It should mm -hmm. be. Yeah, maybe absolutely. that would reduce the prison population. You know, that's an interesting conversation we could have. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, yeah, so that's great. I'm super excited and and grateful to have you part of that. So tell me just a little bit too about you. Who are yeah. you? <laughs> yeah, who am I? Um, well, I... Uh, I'm from California. I'm from the Bay Area. I grew up in a town called Cupertino. 
Um, my parents moved to this country when I was four. So I was born in India. We moved here when I was four. And, you know, adjusting to a new land, adjusting to a new set of rituals, a new culture, I learned a lot. I mean, I, I really kind of grew up here entirely, but seeing my parents adjust and kind of grow up with me, I'm an only child uh, with them. It was sort of an incredible life experience. You know, we we all, we all, we've lived in the Bay Area for 20 plus years. My mom is a public school teacher. My dad is a, uh, he, he works as a, uh, was trained as a civil, uh, civil engineer and now works uh, in tech. But, you know, growing up, I always had this acute appreciation for how your mind is. My mom would ask me before I would sleep, you know, what is the quality of your mind? Uh, it's, it was a, that's a literal translation and a phrase that she would use in her, our native language, Kannada. She would ask me every night, what, what is the quality of your mind? And I think growing up hearing that um, question a lot, I started asking myself, how am I doing? Not what did I do, but how am I doing? And getting into that practice, I started opening up more. I started talking to my friends, started talking to my teachers as a young kid. And I, I realized that how I was doing was probably the most important question out there. Um, and uh, the older I got, the more I realized this question was central. You know, I went to college out at Dartmouth and when I was there, I think I probably experienced my first um, true phase of anxiety, maybe even depression, none of which was diagnosed. But looking back, I definitely exhibited a lot of the symptoms. Um, part of it was being in the middle of nowhere because Dartmouth is in New Hampshire and a very small town. And part of it was just not knowing how to adjust to this new social environment. And I think growing into the, the limbs there. Um, but for whatever it's worth, my 22 years plus of not knowing what anxiety was, um, uh, compared to the last eight years where I've realized, you know, what mental health looks like and how all of us probably could use some form of help. Um, I've, my career has taken me in a number of different routes, um, including government. I helped elect a member of Congress, uh, Ro Khanna, he represents the Silicon Valley. And while we were working together on the race, I came back home to do political organizing. I realized that all these kids just needed to get asked the same question, you know, how are you? Because we, we, we had so many kids who helped us on the campaign. I mean, the kids got Roe elected into Congress. Super cool. But every day I would ask the kids, like, hey, how are you doing? And I would hear an answer that did not make me happy. More often than not, people would say, I'm stressed. I'm burnt out. I'm anxious. I'm not feeling hopeful. And I thought, OK, there needs to be something that we do for these kids. So on his first day in office, Roe and I co-authored an editorial in the San Francisco Chronicle around five steps that school boards can take to improve mental health. One of those was actually just asking that question, how are you doing at scale? So now every kid gets asked that question in a survey, a clinical survey that the school uses to then determine what initiatives they wanna take. That whole, the whole, that whole process took a few years. Um, I wish it had taken a few days and I have a deep appreciation for how government moves. Um, and I truly do think that government and companies can work together better. It's part of the reason I'm at Talkspace is because Talkspace has been doing some incredible work for the last eight years um, on improving access to mental health care. You know, I was at Google before all this and at Google, I would learn a lot about how companies, good companies are run and they know how to move quickly to address problems that people are facing. Um, and because they only have to work with themselves, it's a little bit easier to move faster. So anyway, I know you're, you're probably not, not asking for all of this, but I, I wanted to give you as much bio as possible to say that my whole life feels like it's led up to this moment where I'm here um, at Talkspace and I'm truly honored to be here and partner with you to deliver care for all these folks that truly could use it. Yeah, that's amazing. No, it's so fascinating. You have a really fascinating background and an interesting journey for sure. Yeah. And I, I love that your mom asked that, that fundamental, how are you question? Yeah. And that also you brought it into the school system. I mean, yeah. we teach we teach the kids about the downstairs and the upstairs brain. Hmm. And the downstairs brain is when you're in that stress response, when you're anxious or worried or in fear or angry or sad, and you can't learn, you can't access your higher brain and your upper brain functioning and thinking yeah. when you're in the downstairs brain. So really that is the most fundamental kind of question we need to be asking, we need yeah. to be asking each other. And, you know, it's interesting when we look at academic outcomes and, yeah. and there's a reason that hope is predictive of your success because you have to be in that upstairs brain. So, yeah. and, and we talk about the stress response. That's kind of the first thing we do to address one of the five keys to hope, but what we have to first address. Um, yeah. And we see right now 
so many people in their stress response, so many people getting triggered by all that's going on, um, a lot of change, job losses, homes. I mean, there is a lot to be stressed about at the moment. Yeah. How can um, Talkspace support people yeah. that you know are dealing with, with stress? It's a great question. So Talkspace helps people who deal with stress by, in, at its very core, providing access to therapy. So therapy is one way people can negotiate their own stress, meaning you end up talking to someone that's a third party. It's someone who you can, and you can really tell anything to because there's no shame. They don't know you. They don't know your personal context, but they're just there to listen. Um, and, and what they do is they kind of help you see the unwritten script that's informed most of your life. Um, they help you see areas where you've gone downstairs using your own language and in areas where you may not even know you've gone downstairs and, and how to kind of help bring out the hope in you. And, and I think of them as really folks that help light up a room that would otherwise be dark. Um, and they help you see what's in there, what's, what's pleasant, what's not pleasant, and they guide you towards a, a better hopeful future. So at its very core, Talkspace is access to a, a therapist. We also have access to psychiatry for people who choose that choose to engage in, in obviously non-controlled substances to help alleviate some of their anxiety and depression symptoms. And then uh, we also, this is free for everyone. There's a core mindfulness and going through a fear, going through worry, going through panic, breathing meditations. There's a whole series of self-care uh, uh, services. Uh, most recently also Talkspace acquired a company called Lasting, uh, which is a part of our family now. And Lasting is a, a relationship counseling app. And for folks who are struggling either in their marriage or their partnership or want to work through something, even if they're not struggling, just to like talk through something and have a framework for going through uh, their well-being, it's, it's a phenomenal app. Uh, and so we, we are all those things. Um, but at our very core, we were founded and, and, and still remain therapy focused. Yeah, that's amazing. And I think such an important point, something we need to point out is that therapy isn't just for someone that's has clinical depression or yeah. anxiety. I mean, we all need support from strong people um, helping us navigate challenges in life. And, and I think um, your therapists, a lot of them use problem solving therapy and yeah. CBT, which are very action kind of oriented therapy. Yeah. Be it's not the old sit on a couch and like go through yeah. all of your, <laughs> you right. know, right. which is what a lot of people think of as therapy or yeah. that it means something's wrong with you. And so I think it's, you know, we're all stressed. And so yeah. it's, totally normal to need help and to want to get help to manage that stress. Totally agree with you. Yeah. I actually think that therapy has gone through a really bad branding campaign for the last uh -huh. 20, 30 years. And I talked to people about it and some people are like, you know, I told my dad, I was talking to somebody, he's like, I told my dad I'm going to therapy. And he was really worried that I had like suicidal thoughts and that's totally normal, right? Some people do have those thoughts and some people do find therapy to be helpful. But a lot of folks that aren't even at that level, but just need someone they can connect with because they're feeling lonely or they're feeling unsure. You know, therapy is really a focal point for all the different things that could be going on in your mind. Even if you're tremendously happy, I mean, there's no reason why you couldn't actually just connect with someone to talk to them. You would do that for your physical health. So why not for your mental health? You know? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I know. I think everyone should have a therapist, kind of a non-judgmental, open yeah. person they can run things by and just kind of to get a different perspective. And absolutely. I mean, I so agree on the branding. That's why I got started in this. I yeah. mean, mental health overall from a branding standpoint has just... It's, yeah. Just if the you chief look at marketing Andrew. officer of, their, of branding for therapy has just sucked the last 30 years. You know, the, 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 the imaginary CMO who run this campaign. Um, yes, exactly. And that's, and that's another reason I admire your company so much is because yeah. one of the things I've been talking to, you know, people in the mental health space for so long is getting celebrities and leaders engaged yeah. and talking about their own mental health challenges to yeah. really just kind of normalize it because people often think, well, if that can happen to them, it's okay. And it can, and I can be more proactive and you've done a great job. I think you have Michael Phelps, Phelps and then Demi Lovato. That's it's, right. I mean, yeah. that's, that's, that's super. It's, I mean, it's just Michael Phelps. Who's like this a star studded Olympi Olympian, probably the greatest of all time in swimming and almost any other sport. You would never expect that someone like him experienced the bouts of anxiety or depression that he had gone through, but his courage and speaking up has enabled so many athletes to do the same. So 
I mean, we, we love partnering with him and Demi Lovato, obviously, who's such a source of energy for young people, particularly millennials who are like our Gen Zers who are seeing themselves in her music and her words and hearing her say, it's okay not to be okay. I'm not okay sometimes. I mean, she's changing the world by just that st- sentence, you know? Absolutely. So. Yeah, absolutely. That's wonderful. So in talking about the stress right now, how are you personally dealing with stress? What's your like- Thank you. We, uh, Catherine, we're talking yeah. about this, you know? I, sometimes when you're in this work, you don't realize that you are the person you're helping. Like you're just talking theoretically about populations that are anxious. You're like, you know, 72% of Americans experience anxiety. And you're like, I am. That's in that 72%. Um, I, um, I'm doing okay. You know, I think stress is something that uh, it's hard to erase. And in a world where we're all working to achieve great goals, in a world where um, we're focused and we're driven, but also in a world where there's immense isolation and there's so much panic from the deaths of COVID that are happening and even the things that COVID brings up that isn't even about COVID. I found that COVID is like this strange accelerant for all your emotional unpacking. So like people are either like getting really serious about their relationships or they're not sure anymore, right? There are people who are really serious about their health issues um, and what they're gonna do to solve them. It's like, there's, there's no going back anymore. And I think for me personally, I'm experiencing definitely moderate amounts of stress. And I'm proud to work at a company that talks about this. So, you know, on our first day of back at work on Monday, we were all like, what are our mental health action plans? Like, let's put them up on our wall. You know, like, let's write about what our boundaries look like. What, what does it mean to be healthy at work? I'm doing all right, all things considered, but I definitely feel like I'm, I'm 100% with the population I'm trying to help. I'm not above them at all. I'm 100% the group that I'm trying to you know, bring, bring help to. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, for me personally too, last year was like, I felt hopeless at levels I had never understood and felt before. And yet, and, and hopelessness is that feeling of despair and the sense of helplessness. So you feel horrible about something and you don't feel like you can do anything about it. And there were so many different things that we encountered from COVID to all of the racial, you know, all that happened. Yeah there and and it was that real extreme sense of helplessness and and despair and yeah that informed so much of all of the work we did last year yeah. around hope um it's beautiful yeah and what it takes to get to hope and that hope isn't a destination it's a continual practice that we right. you know have to aim it's beautiful and, and so and the second part or the second key to hope is you know getting to those happiness habits and practicing staying in those mm. upstairs brain and like and so what is, what are some things that talk space and, and that you personally do no I'm, talk space is and there's a bunch of apps there around deep breathing and mindfulness and um, i would actually encourage everyone to download the app and they can use it um, and see for themselves the self-care work that exists um, I, I have a little uh, eightfold path. I don't know if you're how familiar you are with Buddhism, but uh, Buddha has like an eightfold path towards enlightenment. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to create my own eightfold path for this year. Uh, what, let me read it out loud. It says meditation, exercise, gratitude, reflection, water, connection, development, and reading. So if I do those things, then I feel like I'll be that's my happiness habits, you know, Mm -hmm. waking up in the morning and writing things I'm grateful for, going to sleep and diarying a little bit about the day, meditating, um, being connected to people, calling my people more, small things like that. I don't think it's rocket science, but you got to figure out what works for you. You know, you have to like, I think you can read a book and say, all right, these are the five things that you have to say, people say, but like, if you don't take control of your own happiness habits, which I love that phrase, then it won't happen, you know? Um, Yeah. No, absolutely. And we say that too, like, I can give you all this insight about hope, but like, you've got to do the work. You've got to want to feel that and get there and practice those things. Yeah. And in times of great stress, those are generally times where we abandon all of them and go to our addictions and our eating and our binge watching and our, you know, (laughs) just to kind of get out of Of feeling anything. Yeah exactly yeah and so and that is too one thing last year i felt on such a deeper deeper level than i'd ever felt like the emotions and just allowing the emotions to come as opposed to repressing them or ignoring them or not feeling them was a really important thing that i personally kind of went through last year so um yeah 
That's amazing. I like your habits. Thank you. I appreciate <laughs> it. I got, I got the hopeful city certification. Let's go. Um, I know exactly. Yeah. Even smiling. So someone, it, it, they really, it releases endorphins and yeah, it's serotonin seems- probably so silly you know yeah Yeah. um and laughter and stuff like that i mean you can practice these things (laughs) you know yeah Yeah, i remember when i was a kid going outside and see like laughing yoga people were just like laughing and i'm like that's a thing people do they just like actively laugh i know (laughs) know. wow that's pretty cool you know so yeah yeah that's so true And so what about, and then the other thing is taking inspired actions and kind of goals. So a lot of the research around hope is, is agency and pathways to getting like a vision and kind of getting there. And so we teach smart goals, um, which are specific, measurable, attainable, Mm -hmm. relevant, and time bound. Do you, yeah. yeah, Do you um, subscribe to that yourself? And yeah, yeah. definitely. And, and so does talk space. I think we, we think of one of the cool things about talk space is that um, we uh, actually show you your anxiety and depression levels or your stress levels. We actually measure it. And then it's not like hidden in a black box. You'll never see it. We actually show it to you. We're like, here's how you're doing. Um, and it's a great focal point for a conversation with your provider. It's like, we measure everything else. Well, and we tell you your blood ro- like reports. Why don't we share this stuff? It's like probably more important than anything, you know? And uh, I think that inherent in that is smart, right? Specific, it's measurable, it's all attainable. I mean, uh, the acronym makes so much sense because um, at, its, at its core, a goal should be something that changes your life. And for something to change your life, it has to fulfill some of those dimensions, right? Uh, I personally subscribe to a lot of that. Yeah, my, I have like, uh, I have a few goals for myself this, this upcoming year as well, like big goals that I wanna hit personally, professionally, you know, um, and I think that those goals are also smart bound, but having that, I think having a goal is also a sign of hope, right? That's what you're probably teaching, which is it, it suggests that you can see a future that's continuously better than the present, right? Yeah. Um, so yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And future orientation. And, you know, we teach, you can't get attached to those goals because sometimes we have to change those goals or, but setting realistic and really thinking through that framework is so important for getting there. And, you know, the need to pivot and to chunk down your goals when they feel too, too large. These are kind of all things we kind of go through. So yeah, it's so important. So that's great. And, and what do you do when to get out? So say you feel stuck around something that's going on or a goal or something, how do you navigate that? How do you get out of your stuckness? Yeah, I'm a stuckness. It's a good question. I usually don't. Well, okay. What I used to do when I'd feel stuck was I would try and deny that I felt stuck. And then I would like, kind of like reality distort. Be like, I'm not stuck. I'm actually happier than I've ever been. And then that would eventually collapse and burn or turn into some other emotion. Um, I let myself feel it for a little bit. You know, on New Year's Eve, uh, my partner and I were about to celebrate with people uh, on Zoom. And the night before, I just felt like this wave of sadness hit me. And I just like sat on the ground and I was like, I feel sad. And I am not one in my circles to be the sad person in the in the sense that most people identify me as like this hyper positive, hyper energetic soul. So when like my energy goes down, everyone's like really worried. Like my friends and my family were like calling and checking in on me, which is the sweetest thing of all time. But I think part of accept is stuckness is accepting stuckness and then seeing where you feel it in your body. And for me, like accepting that, you know, a lot of my Buddhist practices around seeing it, recognizing it, accepting it really, you know, not trying to fight it identifying where it is in the body and then not making it personal right it's like not saying it's something i am always stuck or i'm the kind of person who gets stuck but just says the stuckness is going through me right now and it will leave eventually like all things but it will leave and i think that's a really good way for me it doesn't feel that good um stuckness never feels better but it feels good knowing right now that when i feel that way i have a plan you know in my own head I think that, and then I like playing the guitar. Like I've been jamming. Um, I've been like singing more. I've been getting out of the world of work. I think there's such an obsession around productivity in our culture that I feel like if I'm not productive, then like, what am I doing with my life? If I'm not writing the next book or starting the next political campaign or government enterprise. Like what, it's like 
this infinite desire to do more and always think more. But I'm like, you know what? Let me just like sing really bad pop songs from the 90s for like the next hour. <laughs> and then just watching my mind be like, chill out, man. Pump the brakes, you know? Uh-huh. Um, and that really, that does help me actually. So Yeah, that's awesome. Are you going to give us a little right now or? I could probably bring my guitar over if you want. <laughs> Um, but no, like, I mean, I would I love it. it. Yeah. But like, like Blink 182 is my go-to or like, you know, like trashy, like rock music from the 2000s. It's just bowling for soup. Does anyone even listen to them anymore? Like no one <laughs> listens to them except for me. Fountains of Wayne. Like I just listen to like random rock groups from like 2000s and still get me so happy. Uh-huh. Yeah. That is awesome. Yeah, it's so good that you've identified that. And that's part of like, a lot of times we're not even clear on like what reduces our stress or what our happiness habits are and even writing those down and then being really proactive, yeah. like practicing them right now is so important. The other thing we talk about hope is networks and creating a strong network. Yeah. And I've heard you talk about your friends and family and, yeah. you know, talk space who are like how... And, you know, especially for people out there that have challenges right now, connecting with others or don't have family around or have challenges with, like, how do you create a network and uh, for hope and how does talk space also kind of support that? Good question. I think of my network, my hope network as a group of people that see the best in me and want the best for me always. It's a very tough group because not everyone, even some of your close friends see like express themselves in that way you know like I think what I'm realizing is my hope network is really my parents my, my partner and maybe a few of my like 100% my closest friends and perhaps a, a coach or a teacher I have a woman um, who I've been speaking with for some time who's sort of been like a mentor guide for me she's a trained psych, psych she's a trained therapist she's since retired but every month we'll have like a nice call about life and how I'm doing and She'll help me reframe things. It'll feel a lot like therapy, but I think probably her, my partner, who's just honestly in another life, she could have been a therapist, um, which, but I, knowing that makes me also not want to talk to her like too, because I don't want to burden her. But I think her, my, my, my coach who I've been reaching out to, my parents um, and people who unconditionally love and want the best for me always, period, and are able to express that in a way that I'm willing to hear. Um, and that's a small network, you know, it's not, it's not more than a handful. Um, and I think, you know, I, I, you have to be selective about this, I think, you know, cause you, you, I, one thing I'm realizing as I get older is that, um, there are a lot of people that you will love who will love you and who will be your close friends, who will be some of your best friends, but you have to know what it, what energies they bring in your body and your mind. And the more aware you can be of the right energies you want to filter in the better off your mind will be. It's not that there's anything wrong with them. It's just that in your own life, you have to be mindful. You have to be the per- the protector of your own well-being at all costs, right? So I think your hope network has to be very deliberate. And those are some of the folks in mind. Yeah, I love that. And such great messaging and, and so important in a world where we have social media and thousands of friends and all yeah. of these people, you know, it's very deceptive. I mean, we really need to work to, ha- to cultivate you know, and again, it's, it's very, mine is very small as well and, yeah. and has those trusted and best interest in my, in yeah. mind. And also, as you say, learns to talk to you and share kind of wisdom in a way that's good for you and that you can yeah. hear it. I, you know, I feel exactly the same. And, and Dr. Balfour says, you know, a, a child's a prediction of how well a child will do is do they have a best friend? So, mm. you know, we ensure that each and every child has at least one person that they can talk to. And, and yeah. that's so important in really all areas of life. So yeah, I love yeah. how you, I love how you describe that. Just one kind of last thing about just the pandemic right now and what we're going through and, and something we talk about is controlling the controllables. Yeah. And we are, you know, a lot of, a lot of the reason we go to hopelessness is because we try to control things that are out of our control. Mm. Um, and there is a lot that's out of our control right now. And if we focus on that, it can lead to really extreme hopelessness and hopelessness is the primary symptom of anxiety and, and, key in depression and also predictive of suicide and so what are you finding right now that you can control with what's Mm. going on and can't and just any advice or thoughts for the listeners on that yeah thanks i think what you can control is your breath 
um, or I think sometimes you can control, you probably can't control your breath most of the time, but I think being deliberate about breathing and feeling breaths and feeling the power of your body, I really do think your body keeps score. There's a book about that, I think, mm -hmm. uh, but I think the body does register your emotions and treating your body like you would treat your best friend or someone you love or your pet. I think that's, that's really key, you know, whether it's drinking water, whether it's breathing, um, whether it's just waking up with uh, an awareness of all the different pain in your body. Sometimes we, our, our body registers stress here or in our legs or in our feet. Sometimes we're shaking our foot all day. I think the more we bring awareness and kindness to the sources of stress in our body, that's like a first thing I like to, con I like to control. Or I like to know that I can control. And then I think beyond that, goes back to my happiness habits around like actively writing what you're grateful for you know even if it's something material like you don't have to think about gratitude as like this thing that you're gonna have to present to a board you know a, a gratitude can be like i'm grateful for my coffee cup because it stores my coffee and it's super warm i'm grateful for my socks because i love them um more recently i invested in a peloton <laughs> and it was a phenomenal investment and i'm like you know what like i'm grateful for this material possession of mine so I think there's a lot of room for gratitude, a lot of room for mindfulness. Um, those are things you can control. I think people in your life, to some extent, you can control how often you communicate to them, whether it's lower or higher, and you have to modulate that volume. But really, it's the people, you know, you can always call someone you love. If you can call someone that you love and just tell them you love them, even if they don't say it back right away, or even if they have to say it back in a different way, or if you, if you end up getting like a, something in the mail from them, as a thank you. I just think expressing love in this time of hopelessness is so key, not with any expectation of them doing something grand, but just because you feel like the world could use more of it, you know? Um, so I think some of that stuff and then honestly, music, um, music cures me. So I love listening to music. I love playing music. Um, it just sets me in a different world for the day. So um, those are some things that come to mind. A lot of things you don't have in control. Sorry to answer that second part of your question. Yeah. Can't control pandemic, can't control who wins the election. Although this year looks like it's heading in a better one than, than the last few. Um, but, you know, I feel like um, you just have to accept that. Some, some of this is just acceptance and not try. I mean, I guess, sorry, I'm rambling here, but yeah. I, I feel like you have to just accept there's a lot that you cannot control, you know? And I think that is hard for people who are like, I command my life. <laughs> I am the captain of the ship that determines the trajectory of where I go. And that's how I've lived. And then only to realize, wait, there's external things that have nothing to do with you that are just going to throw at your life, you know, um, and you got to accept that. That's just the world we're in. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah, no, absolutely. About one of the hardest things is I want to help everyone. And a lot of people don't necessarily want help or want change or, <laughs> you know, so that's, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah it's been but you should, you should trust that you're doing that, Catherine. And I think this up to my, some of them, I mean, all the stuff we do, it registers somewhere deep down. It may not yeah. be obvious. It may not be tomorrow, but like over the course of life, that stuff tends to unfold where they're like, Oh my God, I remember that person was talking about hope a long time ago. I wonder like yeah. how she's doing. Cause that really did help me. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah that's that's sweet um yeah and i just want to end talk just like for a few minutes on hopeful cities so yes. super excited to launch this we launched a campaign in reno and we're kind of in the process of launching it we got for the first time ever the entire city therapy um yeah. we have we have billboards, ads. Um, we have a 30 day global hope challenge that's free that talks about the kind of the science of hope and takes you through 30 days of just quick videos on what we kind of know about hope and, and where therapy kind of fits into that. So really excited. That's at hopefulcities.org if you want to learn about it. And so again, I think such a you know, so historic, the talk yeah. space for an entire city, and it's kind of a gateway and, and support and bridge to in-person therapy as well. And um, yeah, we're just really excited about it. So how do people find out, how can people get in touch with talk space or get it for their cities? Yeah. So if you're interested in getting, getting this for your cities, you can actually just go to talkspace.com um, and you know what, uh, let me just give you my email and there, there you can go through Perfect. the website and register and put in your demo. But if you're yeah. listening in your city and you think you could provide care, my email is Tharun, T-A-R-U-N dot G-A-L-A-G-A-L-I at talkspace.com. That's 
T-A-R-U-N as a number dot G-A-L-A-G-A-L-I um, at Talkspace.com. And you can always reach out to us. Um, we also have a, um, a website, Talkspace.com. You can look up our business page. There's, there's a great space for you to just say you're interested in providing access to care. And we can come up with a plan um, and, and figure out whether, you know, how, which populations you want to target first and how you want to do it. Um, and we're, we'd, we'd be honored. So, yeah, I mean, that's how you do it. It's as simple as reaching out to us um, or they can reach out to you, Catherine, I'm sure. Yeah. And you, you could put us, they could put us, put us in touch with us. But yeah, it's been an honor to work with the, the city of Reno um, along, alongside you. And hopefully we continue to do this for as many cities as, as, uh, as are interested. Yeah, that's great. And if you're a city and in, in leadership in cities and thinking, I can't afford this, you know, the World Bank published a paper with the World Health Organization. There's a four to one return on investment for interventions. And also we know at least 18 to one for prevention. So for schools program, we have a free school program to it, Hopeful Minds. And I would suggest you really can't afford not to do, yeah. to do this. So um, yeah, it's time we kind of transform how we talk about mental health and therapy and support and get people care they need. Yeah. Um, impacts all aspects of the city, safety, violence, homelessness, kind of, yeah. So, um, so wonderful. Well, thank you so much for joining today. It's, I have loved getting to know you through our project and it's great to get you here and, and kind of go through and spend some time with you. So any other thoughts for our listeners or yeah. No, Catherine, I just would, I would echo that right back at you. Um, you're, you know, you're doing some incredible work. Your whole life is so mission driven and it lights, uh, it lights up all of us. All of us are energized by your, uh, by your determination, your persistence, your focus on the things that you know matter to you. Um, and I think that itself is a, such a sign of hope for all of us. So I would tip my hat back over to you. Um, my only final thought is that um, it's okay to not be okay. Um, and for those of you that are high achievers trying to do a hundred different things, it's okay if you don't do any of them this year. You know, I, I still accept you and love you unconditionally. You can still accept you and love you unconditionally. And if any of that feels like it's tough, you know, obviously you can go to Talkspace, you can reach out to a friend uh, or, you know, my shameless plug and not, not even, it's not even a plug for me. It's a plug for something else, but there's a book called radical acceptance by Tara Brack. I must've sent this to like every friend of mine, but I would highly recommend it. It's, it's a beautiful, beautiful way of accepting yourself and, and, and going through some of the cobwebs that make it hard. So I appreciate you, Catherine. And thank you awesome. for hoping. Yeah. Thank you so much. And thank you all you listeners for tuning in. Appreciate it. We'll put all the info in the bio for the podcast and wishing you all a wonderful day. And if you need support, you know, reach out. There is no shame in reaching out. So thank you so much.